Levi tells me that on this stage there have been three Israeli prime ministers, Elie Wiesel, and countless other dignitaries. So as you can imagine, it's a pre pretty big honor for a simple goy from the prairies to stand before you today. That's a bit of what it sounded like in Montreal a few days ago on Tuesday, March 26th, when Conservative Party leader Pierre Polyev filled a packed Beth Israel, Beth Aaron synagogue and delivered what audience members described as a barn burner of a pro-Israel speech. Now, you might be wondering why I'm playing this tape in today's episode, which is about Justin Trudeau's meeting in Vancouver with four members of the city's rabbinical association and with the chair of Vancouver's Jewish Community Security Advisory Committee, Jason Murray. Well, I'm playing Polyev because we don't have an actual recording of the meeting with Trudeau. It took place the next day on Wednesday, March 27th, and it's definitely a contrast in approaches to doing politics with the Jewish community after October 7th. The conservative leader's talk was heard in person by over 1,300 people. It was also videotaped, and that video is being shared widely. We've put a link to it in our show notes. And Polyev was wearing one of those bring-them-home-now silver hostage necklaces. The Prime Minister's private chat with Vancouver Jews happened in the Temple Shalom Synagogue Library boardroom with five Vancouver Jewish leaders and three Trudeau staffers. There was nothing mentioned on the Prime Minister's official agenda that it was going to happen. And the next day, there was no readout about what was said. And the only reason we learned about it was because Trudeau tweeted about it the next day with a photo showing him sitting in the boardroom at a table with his back to the camera listening to Conservative Rabbi Susan Tendler from Beth Tikva Synagogue in Richmond, B.C. And while Rabbi Andrew Rosenblatt of Sharet Sedek, the Orthodox congregation, looks on. Several of the rabbis who attended told me they've received criticism for meeting with Trudeau, but they thought it was important to tell him about all the security problems that Vancouver's Jews are facing since October 7th. We've been relatively lucky here in BC. We haven't had firebombings or shootings of our, at our synagogues or our schools you know, where they shoot bullets into the windows and, and doors. But it feels to me as if it's a matter of, of if, not if, but when. I'm Ellen Besner, and this is what Jewish Canada sounds like for Monday, April the 1st, 2024. Welcome to the CJN Daily, a podcast of the Canadian Jewish News, sponsored by Metropia. It wasn't the first time since October 7th that Vancouver's Jewish rabbinic leaders have met Trudeau in person. They did again back in December in a roundtable, but that was announced on the PM schedule. It was together in a multi-faith meeting with a group of Muslim leaders. But that was closed to the media. This time, they had no multi-faith meeting. The Jews went first. The Muslims later on met Trudeau at an iftar dinner in Vancouver. Here's a bit of what the Jewish leaders told the prime minister. Number one, since October 7th, Vancouver's Jewish community is spending $100,000 every month on security guards to protect buildings and events. And that's up 1,300% from what they used to spend, which is about six dollars to $7,000 a month. Number two, Jews are getting swarmed on the SkyTrain by mass mobs of Palestinian supporters who call them Nazis and other genocidal insults. Number three, Jewish plays are being cancelled by BC theatres who say it's for the Jews' own safety. Number four, hate crimes against Jews in Vancouver are up 62% since last year, according to the police. So what did Trudeau promise, if anything? Well, he did tweet a couple of lines on his social media account. Quote, around the table, we discussed the importance of ensuring Jewish Canadians feel safe in our communities, and we agreed that acts of hate and racism must never and will never be tolerated, unquote. Joining me now from Vancouver is Rabbi Dan Moskovitz of Temple Shalom. Rabbi, thanks for being on the CJN Daily. Hi, Ellen, and thank you for having me on. Rabbi, how did this whole meeting with Trudeau get arranged? About 10 days before the vote in Parliament on the NDP motion against Israel, the Liberal MP for our riding, where my synagogue and most of the Jewish infrastructure of Vancouver is located, Talib Nur Muhammad reached out to me. And Talib and I have worked together many times on issues of security and interfaith relations. He's been a solid supporter of the Jewish community of Vancouver and actually was instrumental in securing the $25 million in federal funding for the J West Project, the renovation of our Jewish Community Center and uh, Federation and our Jewish high school. 
Tali reached out and asked me what I thought of the motion. And I told him in clear and stark terms that I thought the motion was abhorrent, that it endangered Israel, rewarded Hamas terrorists, would embolden others in the region against Israel, and would actually be a huge impediment to a lasting and sustainable peace. I said, Canada cannot unilaterally declare a Palestinian state. What are the borders of that state? What is their government? That Canada would be doing irreparable harm to Israel and to the cause of lasting and sustainable peace in the region, to say nothing of abandoning a democratic ally when it is under attack and in a war for its survival. He said he knew that, and then he said, But Rabbi, a lot of people in my party are going to vote for this motion. It's going to pass. I was stunned by that, but I took him at his word. He said maybe 80, 90, even 100 members of the Liberal Party had lined up to vote in favor of it. We had a long talk, and we went point by point through the motion I suggested some wording to change here and there, and in particular, I urged him to do two things. One, Hamas had to lay down their arms. There could be no end to this conflict if the perpetrators of October 7th were still able to attack Israel as they had sworn that they would do again and again. And point nine, I said, had to be removed. As has been widely reported, Talib was the first to reach out to the NDP MP, Heather McPherson, to consider making amendments. He told me that it was the language that we discussed that was the catalyst to get this done. When the motion passed, I, like many in the Jewish community, was angry. and I felt Canada had abandoned Israel, its ally and friend, in its hour of need, had done so for political expediency and votes. But I also knew that it could have been so much worse. I then used the opportunity to raise an issue that was of grave concern to me and Jews across Canada. The unchecked threats and intimidation that we're, we've been seeing from anti-Israel demonstrators directed at our Jewish institutions and community across Canada. I said that now more than ever, especially after this motion, which I thought would embolden anti-Semites in Canada, that the Prime Minister needed to act and to put an end to the violence and the threats of violence that we were seeing increasing every day. And so I asked Talib to relay this to the Prime Minister. And he said, well, why don't you tell him yourself? And I half thought that he was going to actually hand the phone to the Prime Minister at that moment, which kind of terrified me a little. Uh, but then he told me that the Prime Minister was going to be in B.C. next week, and he was going to try to set up a meeting. Okay, I see his official photographer snap some photos of you all shaking hands, and you in particular, and then there's some that show him uh, posing and smiling with the rabbis and the Jewish leader. Did you get any flack from the community for meeting with the PM? Some have suggested that we should not have taken the meeting, that the motion, even with the liberal amendments, even though it was non-binding, that to speak to the prime minister after this was somehow a reward for him and a betrayal or breaking ranks with our Jewish community. I understand their sentiments. Look, I see it this way. You have to talk to people. As a rabbi, I spend a lot of time hearing what people have to say. That doesn't mean I have to listen, but I do think that you need to hear them. We had a message about safety and security for Canadian Jews. It's an important message, and the Prime Minister needs to hear it. The opportunity to tell him face-to-face, -to, -face, to share stories and make specific requests of his government, is not one to pass up, certainly not one to pass over, up over some kind of uh, political uh, gamesmanship. Whether he will listen to what we had to say, well, that, of course, remains to be seen. But given the opportunity to tell him, we had to take that opportunity. Right. Can you walk me through what you all told him? I opened the meeting by reminding the prime minister that one of the main tenets that all Jews, regardless of whether or not they are religious, hold is tikkun olam, of partnering to repair the brokenness of the world. And it was in that vein that we were meeting. We needed his partnership to stem the rise of anti-Semitism in Canada. More, more than that, we needed his leadership. I said that the Jewish community believes in peace and collaboration, that we strive to improve our neighborhoods and local communities and partner with others to achieve these goals. But, I said, I'm afraid that what we are learning is that those who threaten violence or acts of violence or act with violence, the ones who scream loudest, who intimidate and harass, they are the ones who see their goals achieved by our government. I said to the Prime Minister, you and other political leaders cannot capitulate to the mob. I said that by giving into the mob, you reward bad behavior, and we all know what happens when bad behavior is rewarded. It encourages bullies to do it more and more, and we're seeing that every day. 
My colleagues each shared stories about members in our community that had experienced threats and violence that had gone unchecked by law enforcement and that we felt the situation was escalating. That we saw that what was happening in Montreal and Toronto could happen here. It was unacceptable there, and it's unacceptable anywhere in Canada for Jews to live in fear on the streets, and that his government, and that he, is accountable. That they have no greater responsibility than to keep Canadians safe, and that right now Jewish Canadians are not safe. I hear you gave him specific demands uh, after you told him about the general lay of the land now in B.C. What were those? Uh, During that meeting, we made three specific requests of the Prime Minister. First, that his government renew and expand the security infrastructure program, the SIP program, specifically that we be allowed to use the funds uh, to pay for um, sec- um, security personnel, not just um, for hardening our facilities, but but actually to pay for security guards. The second, that his government press provincial attorneys general to prosecute it, um, intimidation and hate speech. Too often we have seen uh, these situations where there's just The police have just done nothing, uh, and uh, people continue to scream and yell and threaten and harass. And third, that he press his initial security and intelligence advisor uh, on whether Samudun, an affiliate organization of the PFLP, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, which is listed as a terrorist organization under the Canadian Criminal Code, Samudun is a nonprofit affiliate of the PFLP, and we pressed him to investigate... um, and review and assess whether they too could be listed as we feel they should be also under the criminal code as a terrorist organization. As I said earlier, we know what the PM tweeted on his social media, but do you think he listened and also heard you? Did he make any promises? The PM spent about a half of the meeting empathizing with the fear and danger that he said he knows that the Jews of Canada are experiencing. He talked about how it was unacceptable to him that Canadian Jews were being harassed, intimidated, and threatened in the way that we described, and that he knew it to be true. He talked about how he had experienced it firsthand when his dinner with the Prime Minister of Italy, uh, uh, Georgina Maloney, was canceled in Toronto because the Toronto police could not secure the building because of the angry mob of anti-Israel demonstrators outside. And he expressed his frustration with that, his his disappointment, maybe I could even say his anger, that the meeting was canceled because of that and that the police couldn't secure the the facility. Look, I meet with lots of people. I've been a rabbi for almost 25 years. I'm not a mind reader, but I think in that time, in those 25 years, I've developed a, a pretty good radar for when people are sincere or not. I think that the prime minister was sincere. I don't think he takes any joy in the Jews of Canada being threatened and harassed the way that we are. And I believe that he knows it to be true. But I also heard and realized the political pressures and calculations that go into trying to solve this problem without creating other problems for himself, his party, his government. And while I heard and recognized those, honestly, those are not my concern or my responsibility to solve. That's on him and his government. He is obligated to keep Jewish Canadians and, of course, all Canadians safe. He is obligated to protect the right to freedom of expression, to peaceful assembly, and to protest, but also not at the expense or moral danger of the Jewish community or any community or group in Canada. It's a right, but not a license. It's a tough job, no doubt. It's a difficult needle to thread, but it's his job and he needs to do it. We told him that many, many times and in many, many ways in our meeting. We ended the meeting with the Prime Minister making verbal commitments. He made verbal commitments to meet all three of our requests, And then his staff requested that we follow up in writing, which we've done. I'm glad that you're reporting on this, as I think our community and ultimately those that want to see an end to the violence and threats of violence in the Jewish community need to to know what he said, what he committed to doing. They need to know what we said also. And now, like in all things, we need to see if his actions will match his words. I know he heard us. I don't know if he listened. And that's what Jewish Canada sounds like for this episode of the CJN Daily, sponsored by Metropia. Integrity, community, quality, and customer care. By the way, the Liberal who did arrange Trudeau's Vancouver meeting with the Jewish community, Talib Nur Mohammed, voted yes to the NDP's amended motion that dropped declaring Palestine a state. As you heard, only the Conservatives 
and three Liberal MPs, including Anthony Housefather, Marco Mendicino, and Ben Carr, voted against it. Now, Rabbi Philip Bregman, who's emeritus rabbi at Temple Shalom, was also at the meeting. Bregman also brought up another major issue facing BC Jews recently, which is the BC Teachers Federation has passed a motion to call on the province's education department to make it mandatory to teach what they call the Nakba and Israel's occupation of the West Bank and Gaza in the BC social studies curriculum. The Palestinians call Israel's war of independence in 1948 the Nakba, which means catastrophe. Right now, BC teachers can use their judgment in the classroom when discussing the current situation in the Middle East. Thanks a lot for listening to the CJN Daily.